And we realized that data is, a, is something, it's not just an object, it's not just a value somewhere in a file. It's something like it's a, it's a, it's a transaction, and this transaction creates a relationship. And when you say relationship, I think you, you, you mean, or we mean, trust. Behind this, there is trust and there is sharing. And it's very important for insurance because insurance has as a core value trust. I would like to start by asking you what data means uh, for AXA uh, today and, uh, and maybe in the future. In fact, data is everything for us. It means everything for us as an insurer, actually. And it's part of the, uh, our DNA. What is new is a drastic search of three new kinds of data. You have digital data, you have behavioral data, and you have open data. And we will mention it later. And to collect, to use them, we need to change radically our IT infrastructure. And it's the first big challenge. It's a challenge of IT. And we caricature it, to put it simply. To caricature it a bit, um, the way we used to, to, uh, to to collect and to use data for pricing was uh, with a priority of causality. To caricature the new things with data science in the mindset is you don't care about causality and you can survive of correlation. And your priority as a data scientist is to put as many variables as you can. My priority is efficiency of the model at the end. And if I'm able to improve the lift, I will put this variable on the model. But that needs to, uh, the, the consequence of this use of data um, is to be able to have a quick feedback loop to make the, the model improve very quickly. If you do not have this feedback loop, uh, you will make an error just uh, considering this kind of method. So this is also uh, a data science, uh, uh, data science and mathematical challenge. And uh, our core um, priority is to uh, take full advantage of customer data for the business. To give you some concrete example of what we can do in terms of business. Of that. Uh, the, the dream of the marketer is to be uh, to put in place what we call marketing predictive marketing. It's a dream because, to be true, it's very difficult to put to put it into operation. It's more about experiments. But we did some great job in terms of predicting some of what we call moments of life. Uh, we were able, for example, to to, to give uh, with a high level of precision the date of retirement for our beneficiaries in our collective commercial contract based on the expenditures of these beneficiaries in terms of donter, in terms of optic, and so on. To be able to say, oh, this guy is going to take, to, to take the retailer after three months, and to be able to cross-sell and to upsell the product. But I want to be, full, to be true with you, Martin, and to give you also the dark side. What is really important uh, when you have the challenge of taking the most of business from the data is to be really, really focused on what you do from data in terms of business operation. And I will give you this example of a score that we built two years ago, and it was a wonderful score in terms of statistics. Our statisticians were very happy, very satisfied. Life was beautiful. Because we were able to predict the probability of a specific customer to change a vehicle uh, in six months. So it's, it was a huge opportunity for us in terms of business uh, to take this information and to cross-sell our beautiful contracts and beautiful products. But so, so the issue was that, that we, we just sent emails to propose this contract. And the fact that we sent email explains that we did zero in terms of business, in fact, because at the end, few of us just opened the email, few of us click on the email, and at the end, you had a beautiful score for all our customers, but then at the end of the day, you have just maybe one or two contracts, uh, because just because you used the email. And the key insight of that is that the beauty of the lift is one thing, but in terms of business, you need to put all your energy uh, also to identify the good level of action. Is not there, there a risk that somehow uh, we're going to uh, lose the essence of this idea of sharing the risk and in, the, in the insurance, which is uh, the, called the mutualization? Or do you think this is the, the, the end of it, or what do you think? I told you that I was a business guy, so I cannot understand any concept. So, but I will try. <laughs> I, will, I will do my best. Okay. So, the end of mutualization. Okay. So, uh, end of mutualization. I know that it's uh, like the buzzword. It's very important. But I think that it's more a myth than the reality. And I will try to explain you in a few words in a, in a few minutes. Um, maybe we can just give a, a quick, uh, a really simple uh, definition of mutualization. Mutualization is a redistribution of risk among our policyholders. It's quite simple. Um, of course, big data will enable us to better estimate a specific risk for a specific customer. So maybe the part of what we call mutualization will be reduced 
in the in, a, in, a, in, a, in the next years. But they will keep will keep mutualization, and mutualization will remain as our core business and the foundation for pricing model. We have two explanations for that. We have many other explanations, but I will give you two main explanations. The first is that the future is never certain. I'm sorry to tell you that it will it will be very <laughs> difficult to uh, to predict the future uh, because it's still a probability. So you can have a beautiful lift at the end. Uh, something can happen. It's very good for life because it will be very uh, difficult to live in a world with no probability. But there will still be a part of risk adapt. And this part of risk adapt will force us as insurers to keep some mutualization. And the second main explanation, explanation is the fact that, of course, most of the risk in terms of car, household, and so on is explained, of course, by the other real variables, what I do, but also by the external factors. And I can be a good driver, I'm a very good driver, you know, Marcin, very good driver. So I drive very carefully. I remember when we were in New York, it was yes, very nice. I drive very carefully and I, uh, I, I'm a good driver. But of course, if I want to be insured by AXA, I hope that AXA will take into consideration also my environment. Because I am surrounded by bad drivers uh, and I have bad roads because I live in a, in a, in a, in a small village in Auvergne. So, and there is also a bad weather often sometimes. So, most of the risk still is explained by external factors. If we, if we only rely on behavioral factors, we will miss a point as insurers. And it will be very difficult to have a good pricing. And now that we a little bit better understand, like let's say, the, what's data for business somehow, and um, in a responsible way, let's, let's have a look at what people think about it. And this is why it's interesting in our time to uh, witness the fact that the digital networks are creating the opportunity to understand ownership in a different way. But it's true for privacy as well. Uh, because uh, they, we, uh, this is why I use the term transactional data, or personal data. We are always a part of a trend, involved in a transaction. What is absolutely uh, obvious is the fact that people are living, experiencing uh, privacy issues as on an ambivalent mode. You know? They are uh, absolutely certain that they are uh, threatened by many, I don't know who, uh, you know, companies as well as uh, NSA and you know, others uh, that are predating their data, but at the same time they say, well, how can I do with that? You know, I, uh, however, I will accept and I will not read the terms of use, of course, because it's too complicated, I want to use it to have the service provided. So that's why we are in a very complex way of uh, regulating that. Because even at the le individual level, uh, individual behavior, we cannot just rely on a very uh, um, a kind of model, of rational choice, as we used to model that. It's much more ambivalent, and so that's why the research has to go further in this uh, issue. Does it mean that there is a different value? Is it? Uh and if there is a different value of data, so how you assess it? How, how, you, how you know a data is more valuable than normal? Uh, well, the, the problem with the value of the data is that it comes from uh, no, a very old-fashioned way of understanding the, the use of the data before, we, in the previous systems. And because, in fact, it was a kind of a hidden transaction. You know? Because you, knew, you accepted some kind of uh, service, and so you signed the terms of use. And then at the end, you didn't know, even know, didn't know that their, your data will be used in some various ways. This is why usually privacy issues are, not, I think, not well addressed, because it's usually a general issue with a legal, especially in France, where it's always a, a universal view of the problem. No, we need to address it sector by sector. Uh, when you are entering into the discussion about what are the privacy issues in entertainment, it's not the same in health issues, it's not the same in the uh, bank uh, or financial uh, sector and so on. We must put into this uh, system somebody else which is, the, I would say, uh, which will provide some incentives, economic incentives for all these actors to improve the quality of the security. And the only way to do that is to put, uh, it's, uh, the problem, it's not just by, um, because I'm here, but I think that the insurance system is the only one which is really uh, has the experience of that. So, so this is the case for the car insurance should play a, a particular role, you think? It yes, can it can play. Yeah, should or can? He can, it should, I think, because there's no other way. They can become the meta warranter of all the whole system of data, uh, provided that they are able to, uh, to guarantee some quality of the uh, controllers themselves.
it happens in meetings like these general public meetings that uh, people look at, point at me and say, look at this guy, he's the quantum physics, the weird guy. <laughs> so I think the first point I want to, to convey, the first take home message is that uh, I think you will get used to see more weird guys in these sort of meetings because I think uh, what is happening, and this is something that you can see, is that <clears throat> our information devices, I mean our smartphones and our devices are becoming smaller and smaller. Okay, and this means that information devices are getting to the scale of atoms, and atoms have to be described by quantum physics. This was something that we learned at university or even high school. Okay, so quantum physics is a theory that existed, it didn't exist at Newton times, because people didn't care about atoms, I mean they were thinking about planets and things like this, but when physics reached the atomic war, they had to invent a new theory, which was quantum physics. And I think the, the, the same evolution is now taking place for information devices. So they are becoming smaller and smaller, and they are reaching the atomic work, and then we will have to care about quantum effects. So the data that we were talking about, they will have to be stored in atoms, or they will be stored in atoms. And then when you store uh, data in atoms, you have to, this data become quantum data, simply because you are storing on particles that follow different laws. And now what you want to understand is that since you have these new laws that are at your disposal, what you can do, we like to understand what you can do with these new laws. So, uh, this is the field, okay? This is the general field of quantum information science. We want to understand what you can do when using quantum effects for new forms of information processing and communication. So, in quantum cryptography, what you would like to understand is how you can use quantum effects to secure information transactions. So, in quantum physics, if you look at the quantum particle, you modify this quantum particle. When I, you are at the university, this is something you don't like. Okay, because how come? I mean, what's the state of the particle if when I look at it, I modify it? Okay? But quantum cryptography turns this into an advantage. So if I send you a message, and I put this message in a quantum particle, and the business guy tries to read this message, <laughs> <laughs> so I have to choose you because you are the business. <laughs> what will happen is, <laughs> what will happen is that this action will modify the state of the particle, we will realize of that, and we will stop the transaction. And usually people, uh, the security of, of, of our, of our cryptographic uh, solutions is based on the fact that the, the enemy has to solve a difficult problem. No, no, this is computational security, this is not what we do. We do physical security. So if he wants to read the information, he has to go against the Heisenberg Synthetic Principle that is verified in every lab every day. Hackers, they make our life hard, and now, thanks to quantum physics, we have new tools to make their lives harder. <laughs> a very, very uh, widely used uh, method for equation today is called Eversay. So this method is based on the fact that uh, to factor a number is difficult. So what is factor a number? If I give you six and I ask you two numbers such that the product is six, this is very easy, I guess everyone knows the solution is two and three, right? <laughs> okay, this is easy. But I can tell you that this problem becomes immediately very hard. So I can give you a very big number and I have to I ask you two factors so that this becomes very difficult. And the security of many transactions that happen today are based on the fact that this is difficult. To make 100% statements like end of hacking or everything will be hacked doesn't make sense. It's a complex problem and we have to understand to design better tools to, to protect against these uh, this threats. But there is a quantum computer, right? Google uh, has uh, one quantum computer. Uh, yeah, well, it's not fully clear, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, open data uh, means uh, free available in an open format data produced or received uh, in the uh, service public mission. Nowadays we are working on uh, more of, uh, of the circulation of the data. And uh, circulation of the data means uh, better format, uh, data with better quality. It's not, it's not just Etalab uh, which is working on the subject, but all the administration must uh, modernize the way of working. Should we, be, uh, should we share everything? I mean, everything should be open? All the personal data are not included in the open data, and all the protected data, I mean, uh, different secrets, uh, fiscality, and uh, all, the, all the stuff. Uh, so we got a perimeter which is very fixed, and uh, we are going through the, the, the legislation to improve uh, the perimeter through new notions like uh, data of general interest, like uh, public service data, so new terms, new uh, missions uh, for the government and uh, it's uh, 
the materialization of this of this uh, of this uh, new policy is the API uh, strategy, which allow all the to 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 have a better policy on the open data and open government uh, subjects. Are we catching up with respect to other countries in Europe? Or are we advanced or are we at the same level? Um, sincerely, um, at the beginning of the open data, I mean in uh, 2011, uh, we were quite late because uh, US and Britain, for example. Um, United Kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> United Kingdom done lots of things. Uh, they, they had their own platform, uh, and uh, but it was more like a repository. And uh, France uh, launched uh, the first uh, platform in December 2011, but uh, we we changed uh, the paradigm uh, very very quickly because we imagined that the open data was not was not just a repository, but more. Um, um, a way of discover the use of the data, the reuse of the data. Talking about the future of data, what's, what do you think is the, the future of open data? The future is quite good, I think, because uh, the legislation is, um, is changing. Uh, we've got uh, a numeric republic law project uh, handled by uh, Axel Le Maire, which is uh, in the Senate right now. Uh, lots of discussions uh, about open data, but not just open data. We are talking about open government, uh, empowerment of citizens, and uh, open models, which is uh, another subject that's very interesting. So the, the future is bright, so what, what are the small, let's say, uh, difficulties or challenges that you will have in the... For me, uh, the main uh, difficulty is the... the, the DNA of administration that we must uh, uh, work on. We, mu we must uh, do lots of pedagogy with, uh, with ministries. We must uh, involve all the, the actors of the civil society. Uh, we got lots of subject on research because uh, it's one of my frustrations. Uh, six years after beginning the, the adventure, uh, we don't have a very strong uh, policy uh, concerning the open science. So Thomas Landon is the founder, and and so he is interested actually on 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 looking at open data, but more from a research perspective. And I think this is very interesting not only for research, but it can be also interesting for you know there's a lot of good practice and a good of benchmarking that can be made thanks to to what he's pushing. So uh, the first question is maybe uh, could you tell us a little bit about the uh, yes. Sure. Um, so. My background, I'm a researcher, but I'm a retired researcher from the usual system, let's say. Um, I, I, the idea was to, to develop a laboratory uh, outside the usual academic environment. So outside any campuses, uh, outside any uh, uh, hierarchical uh, dictature, uh, for, for example. Um, so the idea was, can we experiment on basically being completely open completely transparent about our processes of research. So invite, only invite, by not only inviting researchers to work on problems, but anybody. So we built a, a small biotech lab, completely equipped uh, for free just by refurbishing lab equipment in the lab garbages. And, um, and amazingly, uh, and I, by three months of work, we, we had that lab completely, uh, completely functional. But what's interesting is this is an experiment that showed after three years of working with uh, people that were working for free just by, uh, just by pure patients, um, and that those people were not only coming from biotech, they were coming from any kind of uh, backgrounds. There were a lot of engineers, there were a lot of designers, a lot of artists, sociologists, philosophers, etc., entrepreneurs, obviously. Um, we succeeded in creating crazy projects. Uh, Probably just say one example. We even got funded by NASA to work on uh, open source bioreactors when we were still in the squad, but they, they didn't know about that. Um, so at some point, uh, we decided to scale this initiative. Uh, to say, okay, I think we have here somehow the seed of a new model because it's very creative, it's very um, productive, uh, and it's very cheap. Uh, and somehow it revolves around those core values, which is sharing transparency and also counter power. So a lot of projects actually were coming from not only researchers, but people would say, I really want this to be solved. Let's do it. And because all the skills were around uh, the place, 
we thought, we thought everything was possible. At some point, science is all about information. So there is this saying that says, uh, we are small guys on the shoulders of giants, right? So this giants is not a single guy, it's an ecosystem of research. It's an ecosystem of people that are working and are actually collaborating with each other. And at some point you realize that what makes you uh, successful in doing your research is by actually accessing the right data, is accessing actually the right resources. And you don't know where it's going to come from the good idea. So uh, if there is no monopoly for great ideas, at some point you want to enable anybody to access almost any resources they need, you know, and because you're not able to predict where it's coming from, open data and open sense in a more general way um, will actually make sense much more efficient because it's going to bring all those resources to all the people that would actually have the creativity to work on certain problems. Uh, researchers usually work only with researchers. So the thing is, if I understand correctly, it's open in the interaction between people, but the data can be private somehow. So in those cases, everything is open. If you want actually to enable uh, the maximum collaboration effect, uh, you have to put any um, you know, jurisdiction and juridic barriers and ecocentric barriers uh, out, of the, out of the game. So uh, here, everything is open. People can only use open resources, open data. And everything they're doing is like a Wikipedia. It's completely documented. So it's really, it's really a process where everything at any moment is transparent. And at, at any moment, people can join the game and actually help, uh, help out. Basically. Why, why not everybody joins and says, oh, great. I mean, let's, let's get and publish everything and put the data out there. Why don't people do this? Um, what's, what's the obstacle? So the obstacles is uh, probably ego, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right now, the academic systems is pushing for heroes, right? You need to have a cape on your shoulders. Yes, you know, I have my own lab and I, I'm going to save the world. Uh, I'm the best. Um, at the end, uh, but the point of science is to solve issues, to, uh, to bring more knowledge to uh, humanities and help us have a better life, right? So, uh, but this is not depending on individuals. Uh, so at some point, uh, you realize there is, you will make sense much more efficient if you bring uh, down actually this heroic aspect you know, of scientists. And you just actually provide this idea, this new cultural idea that uh, there is no monopoly for great ideas. You know, and uh, um, anybody can actually have uh, a very strong impact, even though they're not researchers and they're not part of the academic system. So far, universities have been spending huge amounts of money for getting back the resources that were made by the public research they've been funding. So uh, it's like you're funding twice the same research. Uh, so it's a bit stupid. This is terrible, but uh, there is a meta study recently that's just shown uh, that more than 80% 80% of all biomedical studies were not reproducible. Because they don't share data. Because there is a lot of bias, and, and because they don't you know, share everything which you, know, you need to, uh, to, to look at to be sure that the results actually are according to the hypothesis, according to the, no doubt, but that the results are right. This all sounds very exciting to me, so how, how you make your initiative scalable? So how you make it happen everywhere? Like how you... How you find it? How you so? It's at some point it's, it needs to be very inclusive. If you want to make it happen, everybody everybody needs to be involved. As much uh, universities, the industry rules, uh, enterprises, and also amateurs. And and what what we are trying to do right now, uh, with is to show that even la the largest enterprises like we just want an initiative with Roche, it's called Epidemia, uh, are actually open to uh, to. Uh, to open access and open data. Enterprises will realize that for their own R&D model, they will need actually to externalize some of their ideas, some of their own resources to, uh, to, uh, to create more external, external positive, uh, like positive external, externalities. So, um, so um, I think that's, that's the right way. It's like coming back to a funding model that is caught up to what happened in the beginning of the 20th centuries, where it was not the state it's true because when you're sharing, you're not necessarily, since this data is a transaction, you're not necessarily sharing something that's yours, but it's a relationship with somebody else. Uh, what, what do you think about this tension, or what do you think what, about the, you, maybe you want to react about what the lower speaker said? And we have here a question, which is a rather political one, which is how sh will, shall we design 
the uh, socio-technical network that will handle the privacy issues and the uh, data that we, are, uh, uh, we have to share. There are two aspects uh, to the whole intervention, I think, I mean, in my perspective, to respond to the culture aspect, mm -hmm. seems not the same here or somewhere else in the Anglo-Saxon country, <laughs> and the second one, this uh, important aspect of the interaction between the state and the other stakeholders. Yeah, uh, exactly. The two many aspects. The first one uh, concerning the culture uh, is definitely uh, different uh, in the Great Britain than in France because uh, they began to launch lots of services uh, with a huge granularity. Uh, I mean, uh, you got a website called police.uk uh, and you can find out all the policemen uh, in the perimeter of your house and on the, on the place that you are located. With the name, with the and you can look at uh, have a localization of all the sexual uh, contained contain, uh, in a def defined area, for example. In France, we can do that. Why? Because we got uh, the CNIL and uh, the protection of personal data. When you got a name and a surname uh, inside a file, uh, the law, the legislation, considered that uh, it's uh, not public data, or we must work on the file in order to make pseudonymization or anonymization with a different way. That's why uh, we decided last year to uh, create a chief data officer inside the government in order to take in account uh, this type of problematics. Yeah, at the moment you get into this data uh, exchange, you get into a transaction where there are traces everywhere. So the right to be forgotten, for instance, is just something uh, kind of fantasy because there's no way you can implement that at the uh, complete uh, level, you know. There is a, a, a EU uh, regulation coming, uh, giving an answer to the question. The answer is no. We need to erase all the data that we collect from customers, but we are not forced to erase uh, what we call calculated data based on the specific uh, data of, uh, of the customer. Just to get back to this... Yeah, but that's the legal aspect. It's a legal aspect. But there is then uh, what the person expects. But, uh, the, the key notion, which is self-determination. And it's critical for us as an insurer because uh, we, we need data to provide services. And to give, a, to give an example, uh, if uh, one of our customers uh, bought a Nest webcam for his home, uh, if you want to be able to provide uh, access services of protection based on the data of this webcam, you need to be able to establish a direct link with the customer. And this idea of self-determination, that is to say that the customer can decide, uh, can get back his data and decide to, get, to take it, to transmit them to the provider he wants is very important for us. Because if we stay as an insurer after Nest, we will be the victim of their API, because API is a good word, but you can do everything on API. You can have API for a few data if you want. So we do not want to be, after the API of Nest, we want to be able, thanks to this self-determination notion, to be able to say to these customers who want to bought our services, hey guys, of course you bought a Nest webcam, but you can decide and force Nest to give to us, the data collected by Nest. And self-determination, it's really important for us, it's a critical notion that we can, uh, we can lobby for. Yes, thank you very much, each of you was very interesting, uh, kind of very different point of views. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so thank you very much for your attention, uh, and uh, we hope uh, to see you again in a moment. <laughs>